Amen, amen, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah, God is good, amen. Hallelujah, it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I would first like to start off by just thanking God for this opportunity to stand before you this morning, that he would entrust me with his word to speak to his people. I am thankful for the opportunity, how he has grown me in this area. I would like to thank God also for our bishop, Amen. Let's put our hands together for our bishop, Wanda J. Sisko. I thank God for her as well in trusting me in this uh, platform to occupy this space. I thank God for her. Um, she came to me uh, not too long ago to ask me to speak today. And when she was coming to me, I kind of knew she was coming with something because <laughs> I could tell she was coming with intent. So. You know, I was like, she coming with something, so I knew. So, honestly, I tried to kind of ease the other way, like tiptoe on, because I, I knew she was coming with something. But she came to me, you know, we hugged, and um, she let me know that she would like me to speak. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, man, we just got our license, what, about two weeks ago? So <laughs> I thought I had a little while longer to prepare myself. But, you know, I am... Um, I accept it, you know, because I know I have to do what God has called me to do, and so the time is now. So I thank God for Bishop, um, for her leadership, for her guidance, for her push, um, and, and the opportunity to be up here, especially in her absence. I don't count that lightly. I thank God for all of you here today. I know that God has something in store for all of you here, whether you are here in the sanctuary, on social media, God has something great in store for you. So I thank God for you this morning. And I also want to thank God for, I have some family members here this morning with me. I have my aunt and uncle here on the third row. They have come in to support, and I thank them for being here this morning. Amen. So I'm going to begin by prayer, if every heart could pray. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. You're worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. God, we thank you this morning, God. We are before you, God, to receive your word, God, to receive what you have in store, God, what you want to speak, God. We say have your way, Holy Spirit, and be magnified in this place, God. Oh, God, I decrease, God, and I ask that you stand up in me, God, that you increase. Lord, oh God, that you touch every heart, every mind, God, every body, Lord God, that you just fill this place, Lord God, with your holy presence, Lord God, and bless your word to fall on good ground, God, your word that brings a light to our path, God. We thank you for that word, God. We bless your name and we honor you, God. We love you and we give you glory. It is in your precious name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. You may be seated this morning. Amen. Y'all ready to get into the word? <laughs> Amen. So our title this morning is Remain in Your Rightful Place. Remain in your rightful place. And so this morning, we're just going to get right to the word. We're going to go directly in, and we're going to take a look at a very familiar text, I believe, that God rested on me. So we're just going to take a look at that text. We're going to explore it and see what he is saying to us. Amen. Amen. So our text this morning is Luke chapter 15. I will be reading in the King James Version. (coughs) 
And honestly, I see you all standing, but we have quite a bit to read. <laughs> it's go we're going to read several scriptures, so um, you may actually be seated. We do reverence the word of, of God, but we're going to go piece by piece through the scripture, so um, you may be seated this morning. Amen. Luke chapter 15, we will start at verse 11. And so this is a familiar text. It is a parable of the lost son, or some may say the prodigal son. So we know that Jesus often taught using parables. And so parables are short stories designed to illustrate or teach some type of truth, principle, or moral lesson. So we're going to go through this parable of the lost son this morning bit by bit, understanding that we should be taking away some truth, some principle, or some moral lesson. Amen? So starting at verse 11, it says, And he said, this is Jesus talking, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So I'll take a stop right there. So here we are in the beginning of the story, and we can see where the younger son's focus is. We can see that his focus is on things. His focus is on possessions because he comes to his father and he asks his father for a portion of the goods. Not long after that, he runs off to another land with his stuff and he wastes it all. So the Bible says he wasted with riotous living. So I looked up riotous and one of the definitions was disturbing the peace. So I imagine he's out there in this other land. He's living large. He's living lavish. He's partying, having a good time. He's not trying to be cautious or reserve what he has, but he's being reckless with it. He's being extravagant with it. So when he journeyed into this other land with his things, with this portion of goods, he was actually journeying into a place of self-sufficiency because he departed from his father thinking that he would be good with this portion of goods, but he ran out. So we have to be careful not to be so focused on things or the resources that God gives us that we end up going into that place of self sufficiency. We can't focus on the blessing thinking that we're so good with this blessing because that blessing will run out. The job that you have might let you go. The car that you have might break down. The money that you got might get a little funny. But these are just things. These are just resources. We need to stay connected to God, who is our source, because without from him, we are nothing. Amen. So let's not get caught up in the stuff. Let's not get caught up in the blessing. Bishop Sisko said something very important recently in Bible study, and that was do not worship the blessing. So if we are focusing on things or prioritizing what we have or centering our life around these things, then we are beginning to idolize those things. And if you are idolizing those things, that means you are worshiping those things. And we cannot worship God and worship things. We cannot serve God and serve mammon. Our worship and our attention and our focus has to be unto God. Do not worship the blessing. Amen. 
So we left off with the son being in want. So let's pick up at verse 15. It says, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. So here we are, and the son connects himself uh, to a citizen of that land, but he himself is not a citizen. He himself is a foreigner to that land. And so the citizen makes him feed what the Jews considered to be unclean animals. He made him feed the pigs. And so the son was so um, in lack or in need that he was even willing to eat from what the pigs ate. So he's kind of, at this point, lost his mind. Why? Because he himself is lost. He was not walking in who he was. He was living beneath of who he was, and he had lowered his standards. He had stooped to a lower level, and no one gave him anything. Why? Because they recognized that he did not belong there in that low place. So this can happen when we become lost or off track or out of position. We can start to live beneath of who we actually are. We can start to dumb ourselves down or try to fit in a place where we do not belong. And what is going to happen there? You may get rejected or disregarded because people will recognize that you don't belong there. They might not let you participate in what is going on or what is happening because they can see that this down here is not you. Amen. So let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Okay, so he was to the point where he was willing to eat what, from what the pigs ate, and no one would give to him. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he comes to the point where he finally came to his senses. He recalled who he was connected to and ultimately who he was. He recalled that he is a son. So here he was in this foreign land hungry while the servants of his father had more than enough food. He recognized that it did not make sense for him to be over here in this self-sufficient place trying to be self-sufficient when he had a father who had more than enough. See, God is our father, and he has more than than enough. The earth is his, and he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So we don't have to focus on this lower level of things. We need to keep our minds stayed upon God. He has all things in his hands. Amen. So the son made a choice. He said, I will arise. He made a choice to get up from the low place that he had stooped to from those low standards and go back to his father. He decides to get up. But in verse 19, we can see that he feels unworthy because it says, um, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. That is what he is planning to tell his father. But he decides to get up from this place of of self-sufficiency But he is now entering to a place of self-condemnation because he is feeling unworthy. But the important part is, even though he feels unworthy, he made the decision to get up. 
He did not allow the guilt or the shame to deter him from returning to his homeland. He still made the choice to return. See, the enemy wants us to get stuck, to get stuck in that guilt and that shame and allow that to keep us from our rightful place. Our rightful place is walking in authority as sons and daughters of God. Walking in who God says we are and having access to all that he has for us, both in this world and beyond this world. The enemy would love to keep us from our rightful place so that we are not walking in our authority, so that we are not walking in our full power, so that we are not any threat to his plans. So as I was reading this story, a particular movie came to mind. We all seen The Lion King, or most of us, if not all. And I know it's a movie, but just go with me for a little bit here. So we know that Simba thought that he was the direct cause of his father's death, and he feels pretty bad about it. Scar tells Simba to run away and to never return. So Simba left his home. He went to another land, and he hooked up with a warthog and what is Timon? I'm not sure. He hooked up with Timon and Pumbaa. <laughs> a meerkat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he hooked up with a warthog and a meerkat. And so what does he begin to do? He begins to eat bugs. He is the king of the jungle. He is not supposed to be eating bugs. So he is now living beneath his standards. He has lowered his standards, and he is living beneath of who he is. So his father had to come walking out on the clouds and say, Simba, remember who you are. You are my son. So why are you down here in this low, dark place eating bugs when everything that the light touches is yours? So Simba gets up and he goes back. He made the choice to go back. Okay, we're going to get back to the Bible. But that just, as I was reading, that popped up and I thought I would just share. <laughs> so we'll get back to the Holy Bible. Okay, so we left off. He made the decision to get up. Verse 20. It says, and he arose. And came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. So here the younger son is on his way back home. He was still a long way off, but the father sees him. He has compassion for him, and he ran to meet him halfway. And so down in 21, we can see ultimately that the son repented. He turned from his lost ways. He sought out his father and humbled himself in admitting his wrong. See, when we make a decision to get back on track, to rise up from whatever low place we have allowed ourselves to sink to and to return, God will meet us there. All God needs is a decision and a willingness from you to turn away from your lost ways. Because that decision means that our will is now unto him. It means that our will is lining up with his will. And his will and our will must be one. Yeah. So when we turn back to God, he will meet us with compassion, yeah. with grace, yeah. with mercy, with kindness, because that's the God that we serve. He is a good father. Yeah. Amen. Okay, so he says, I'm not worthy. So this is what <clears throat> the father does. Verse 22. It says, but the father said to his servants, 
bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to be merry. So the son is caught up feeling that he is unworthy, but the father does not even dignify his statement with a response. He doesn't respond with, yeah, that's what you get for going out there, or no, you're not good enough to be my son. He doesn't disown him at all. He immediately takes action to restore his son to his rightful place. Immediately he takes action. He calls for the best robe. Not just any robe, the best robe. He calls for a ring on his hand. And when I read it in the Amplified Version, the Amplified Version says that the ring is a symbol of his authority as son. And lastly, he called for shoes to be placed on his feet. And when I look up the meaning of the shoes, The shoes symbolize that he is not a servant or a slave because slaves did not wear shoes in those days. So the father was restoring him back to his position as son. He was happy that his son came back and he wanted to celebrate. So the father was showing him by his actions. He was showing him that this is who you are. This is where you belong, even though the son felt unworthy. So we may deal with feelings of unworthiness or self-condemnation after we have gotten out of position or gone and done our own thing. But God is saying to us that you are who I said that you are. You cannot undo your identity by your actions. So even if we think ourselves unworthy, God is there to show us that we are who he created us to be regardless of what we did last night or last week or 10 years ago and it's still haunting us. That does not define us. That does not make our identity. God has spoken concerning us. And when God speaks a thing, it is not contingent upon whether or not it is rainy or whether or not it is sunny or whether or not you agree with it. When he speaks a thing, it is absolute. It is established. When he speaks a thing, so it is and so shall it be. Amen. So while we're here, I want to focus back on verse 22 about the father's response. Let me read it again. (coughs) But the father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. (coughs) So when I read this verse 22, what stood out to me were the words, put it on him. And so I said, why is that standing out to me? And immediately I recall back in October, we were able to witness the consecration of our bishop and the ordination of our elders. At the end of each service, the bishop, the elders, and one of our pastors were all enrobed by fellow clergy or servants of God. They did not dress themselves, but the fellow clergy put the jewelry and or garments on them. So when I read this scripture about the son being dressed, what I received was that this was a type of consecration. And so I looked up what it means to be consecrated, and I found three parts. The first part is dedicating yourself to the service and worship of God. See, the son couldn't serve over in that foreign land anymore. He couldn't worship the blessing anymore. He had to come up out of that place. 
The second part of consecration, when I looked it up, was the separation of oneself from things that are unclean. See, the son had to come from up under those dirty pigs. He had to come up from under those unclean animals. He had to come from that dirty place. And the third part of consecration was being invested with authority to act as a priest or whatever position that you are in. And so in the case of this scripture, the son is invested with the authority to actually act as a son because he was not acting like he was a son he was acting like he was a slave so he had to come out of that slave mentality he had to be consecrated and so we have to recognize that this is the season that we are in we are one unified body when the bishop got consecrated and elevated, the leadership got consecrated and elevated, and the membership got consecrated and elevated. We all got it because we are one. And so this doesn't just mean consecrated to a position or to a title. We are to live consecrated lives as sons and daughters of God. So we have to dedicate ourselves to the service and worship of God. Where is God? He's in the holy of holies. He's in the holy place. And who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that have clean hands and a pure heart. How will we have clean hands if we're over where we don't belong touching on things that are unclean? We have to separate ourselves from the things that are unclean, and we have to walk in our authority as a child of God. We have to live a consecrated life as his sons and as his daughters. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so let's pick back up. Let's continue reading. They're celebrating. They're having a good time. They're glad that the younger son is home. We are at verse 25. It says, now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which have devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. So here we are, the older son finds out what is going on, what is the meaning of this celebration, and he is angry about it. He's not quite happy about what's going on. And the father comes out, and he meets the son in his anger. You see, the father, he met the younger son while he was journeying back from a place of operating out of first heaven. Recall that Bishop has been talking about first, second, and third heaven with us. So the father had to meet the younger son while he was operating, when he came back from operating out of a place of first heaven because he was focused on stuff. He was focused on stuff, and he got off track, and he got into this place of self-condemnation. And now here we are in the story. (coughs) Excuse me. Now we here we are in the story, and the father has to meet the older son while he's operating out of second heaven because he is walking in anger and resentment, and he is allowing that to govern himself. So yes, the older son 
was in the father's house, but he was still out of position because he was not in his rightful place. He was in that place operating out of second heaven. And so what what are these verses saying to us? There may be those close to you who know about your past, and they too will think that you are unworthy. They may not respond with celebration when they discover that you have gotten back on track. They might respond with anger or jealousy or resentment or judgment or whatever it is, but do not worry about addressing it. Let God address them. The scripture says the father went out to the older son. So let God help them to get in the right perspective and shift out of that place of operating in second heaven. Because if you address it, then you might get pulled out of position. So let God deal with it. Amen. So let's continue reading the last couple of verses. The older son has said, you know, how he feels, and here we are at the father's response. Verse 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. So the the father is working with the older son where his heart is hardened. So again, let God work with your sister or your brother. And conversely, if the shoe is on the other foot, if we ourselves witness that someone is getting back on track or back in position, then we are to celebrate them, not walk in anger or jealousy or resentment or hatred or any of those things. We are to celebrate him. That is the position that we are to be in, to respond with love and with compassion. We have to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. God is love. And if we are children of God, then we should be loved as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that concludes the story and in conclusion I just want to say that as we live our life we must remember who we are. We have to remember that we are sons and daughters of God and not be distracted by focusing on things. When we focus on things this will get us off track and our service to God will be hindered. So don't get caught up in the things. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. So don't get distracted by the things. Remember who you are and who you are connected to. When you know who you are, then you know where it is that you are supposed to be. And our rightful place is with God in service and worship unto him, walking in our authority as his sons and as his daughters. We are sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. We receive power to become the sons and daughters of God when we receive Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So that means that the only way that we get to the Father is through Jesus Christ. And so I just want to extend an invitation to you this morning, whether you are here in the sanctuary or on social media. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, then today is your day. Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning and, and receive salvation, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Repeat after me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe on the third day you raised him up from the grave. I confess that I am a sinner, but I believe that you are my savior. Forgive me of my sins. I invite you into my heart. Be the Lord of my life for the rest of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I will be empowered to live pleasing unto you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. If you said that prayer and you believe it, then you, my sister, my brother, you are saved. Amen. And heaven is rejoicing. And we are rejoicing. Let's give God a praise all over this room. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. You're worthy.